I'm Greg Christian, I'm a chef, 38 years in kitchens, and today I'm gonna to talk about our broken food system and some ideas on how we can fix it together. And I'm gonna start with an example of uh, 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 my last project, which was in, uh, at Mililani High School in Oahu, Hawaii. I started in February and I walked in the back door of the kitchen and there's Auntie Deb in her office, and she expected me, and she said, let me show you around the kitchen. I said, great. So we start in the storeroom. We go into this huge room with racks and racks of food, and what's on those shelves are, is almost 100% processed food. There's powders that are in boxes, and they make sauces with these powders and canned fruit. Um, sauces and beans and almost all the food is tasteless and it wouldn't be your favorite food to eat. So Deb, thank you for showing me this. And I'm not picking on Hawaii and I'm not picking on Mililani High School. This is average school America, average hospital America. We walk into the walk, we go to the walk-in cooler, which is a big metal door with a handle. We walk in, we walk through the plastic and we're in this big refrigerator. And what's there is, again, almost all processed food. Canned dressings, there's fresh apples and oranges, they're from the mainland, there's no local fruit in the building. And the apples and oranges are, they almost all end up in the garbage, right? They're dried up, they're shriveled up. You cut that apple, it's a year old, it turns brown immediately. And it's the best that they can do today. Then I said, thank you, and then we will go out of the cooler and we walk to the walk-in freezer, another big, big metal box and we open the door and walk through the plastic it's freezing and what's in there are again almost all processed food so there's uh, hamburgers with 14 ingredients in them that are already cooked you can't pronounce any of the ingredients except beef there's chicken fingers with over 30 ingredients in them totally nasty there's ovenable pancakes that they serve for breakfast there are pancakes that are in a bag one pancake per bag and you put that bag in the oven that you can cook in the bag. I know this might sound crazy. And then you take the bag out and you give the customer a bag that has a pancake in it and fake maple syrup. That's breakfast. There's corn dogs, there's hot dogs, there's chill bags of chili. There's just processed food everywhere. So I say, thanks for showing me around. Now I'd like to meet the team and see the kitchen. And the kitchen's big, big. There's 10 convection ovens. Those are ovens that open like this with a fan in the back. And, 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 and there's three 80 gallon kettles that you boil food in. There's industrial steamers. They have handles like this that turn and they're powerful. And that's for the, all the, 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 the rice that we, we served at, at, at the high school. And then there's some tables. And there's a small bakery section and the team, 20 staff, they were lovely. Auntie Yvonne in the bakery, she's been there over 25 years. Auntie Sun, the vegetable cook, over 20, you know, 25 years-ish. Ed, the head cook, 19 years. Gloria, and just a team of people that, I ask them why they work in the kitchen, and I get the same answer from almost all of them. We really like the kids. Auntie Yvonne, who's in her middle 70s, I said, when are you retiring? And she said, I like the kids, like loves the kids. So I ask them all, is it okay if I help you try to make this a little better? Because I want their permission because it's their house and I'm an outsider and they don't know me. And they said, yeah, we don't know what that means, but you can help us and we'll do our best. I said, great, that's all I want. So they said, what are you going to do first? Because they were all kind of ready and nervous. They were very nervous. Deb and the team says, what are you going to do first? Because they're ready. They're scared. They're ready. They don't know. And, they, and I said, well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go talk to the customers. And they were, they were like, you're going to go talk to the customers. I said, yeah, I'm going to walk into classes. I'm going to get permission and walk into classes and find out what the customers want to eat. 
And then I'm gonna ask you second, kitchen team, what do you wanna make for these customers who you love? And then I'm gonna go talk to some farmers and ask the farmers, what do you got? And then we're gonna melt those three together. So they were ready for action. I needed a little bit of time to uh, kind of meet the customers because I'm, I don't know what the customers at Milani High School want to eat. And that first day, I went and talked to customers at, in the classrooms, and then I observed lunch. And what I saw at lunch was this. I saw a bunch of not turned on cooks, 20 cooks, but they're kind of walking around, very uninspired, not a lot of purpose in their gait, going through the motions. And then I see the customers coming through the lines and they've got their trays and they're getting the thing and they're getting the canned fruit and they're getting the canned beans and they're getting the frozen chicken fingers and nobody's totally excited about lunch. And then they sit down and the customers take a few bites of food, some more, and they throw a lot of the food out. Thousands of pounds of plate waste a week at the high school, tons of food in the garbage. So we start, the first thing I did is I went out and bought 10 sharp knives because I asked to see their knives. Auntie's son, the vegetable cook, is the only one that had a real knife. So I ask, okay, let me see your knives. And somebody goes over and they get a stool and they put the stool down and they climb up on the stool and they open this cabinet and they take down this Tupperware box of knives and they put it on the table and they take the lid off and they say, that's our knives. I say, oh. You got knives. There's a lot of knives. They said, yeah, they're not, they're not sharp. And I said, oh, why do you keep them put away? And they said, well, we don't use knives. We don't need any knives to make food 2,000 lunches a day. I said, oh, okay. So we're going to use knives in this kitchen. So I went out and bought 10 sharp knives. I went out and bought 10 new cutting boards. One of the first things we did is we bought a, you know, a pallet of fresh papaya, local, pap local papaya. This was unheard of and we washed the papaya and I set the team up and we cut the papaya and we served the papaya. And we bought some local ground beef and we made hamburgers by hand. And then we made some uh, kimchi. We bought fresh broccoli. We steamed fresh broccoli, not frozen broccoli. And we started buying all this fabulous local food and cooking it for the customers. What happened when I walked in the door is there were 20 staff with 20 hearts not connected and 20 minds not connected and we got them to connect and move as one, one beating heart in that kitchen, one mind in that kitchen. Teamwork, inspired. They started exercising in the mornings on their own. This was their idea. They said, Chef, we want to start exercising every morning. And I'm like, well, I need some exercise. Let's, let's all exercise every morning. And when, we, when I walked out the door, a few months later, we had a team working as one, one beating heart, one mind, fabulous food. Sure, it's gonna get better. We increased how many people came to eat the food. We reduced plate waste. We bought thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of local food that they hadn't bought before. And we had kids doing projects all over the school. At a minimum, they were texting each other, what's for lunch? And at a maximum, there were videos and photographs and articles written and projects in the library in the math class. And the student council turned on. The student council ended up going to the legislature telling the senators and the representatives of Hawaii, we want all schools to have this. That was their idea. What I didn't tell Deb when I walked in the door, uh, I didn't want to scare her, and I really haven't talked a lot about this until now, is that I knew what it was gonna look like when I was done. Not exactly. I didn't know the exact menu. I didn't know which cooks were gonna to rise to the occasion. I didn't know what the customers wanted to eat. But I knew the energy. I knew that when I walked out the door, there was gonna be this team working as one, serving fabulous food that the customers wanna eat. And their customers are gonna eat more of their lunch because it's better. And I try, I don't start projects until I imagine what it's gonna look like when it's done. And this is related to, for me, 
a world that works for everyone. So I walk with this dream of a world that works for everyone. And what that means to me is that everybody has clean water, everybody has access to health care, everybody has enough food on the planet, everyone has education, access to education, people live in peace everywhere, and people are treated right and respectfully, including in this country. Respect everywhere. Now, I'm a cook, so I have no idea how to get everybody clean water, right? I have no idea. How, peace, like I have no idea how to help. So I work in kitchens. So I do this kitchen work. This tiny little project, I just gave you an example of at Milani High School, is related to a world that works for everyone, to me. It's not linear. So the Milani school work is not linearly related to a world that works for everyone, but it's connected to me. So I hold that dream in my heart. And I hold the dream on, back to my example, in my heart. Now the thing I bump up against in holding on to these dreams, if you'll let me talk like that, these pure intentions, is sometimes I get mad. And sometimes I get sad. Sometimes I get mad at the food system. Sometimes I just am blown away by all the chemicals we're using and how we're mistreating animals and the land and the water and the farm workers. I have abused farm worker stories that I won't share right now. And I get mad. And I've got the food system on the hook. And when I do that, it disables me. It, 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 it takes power from me. I suffer. Sometimes I go to self-pity when I have the food system on the hook, right? And I, and I think, woe is me. What am I doing this work for? The food system is gonna be a mess forever. Um, but more than self-pity and sadness, I, I hang out in anger and I'm mad at the food system. And then I go into Milani and we, I started buying fresh garlic, right? And I bought 20 pounds of garlic a week minimum because we needed fresh garlic in real food so the customers like it. They were using this powdered garlic. I threw all that out. And now I got the food system on the hook. I've already gone to the internet. I've got an agreement. People are sending me emojis and they agree. And I go to meetings and everybody's like, keep the food system on the hook. The food system is wrong and we are right. And now I got the fresh garlic on, at the cutting board, right? And I'm trying to, and I'm, and I'm disabled, right? I, 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 my heart isn't totally in it. My mind isn't totally in it because some of my heart and some of my mind are going into what I have on the hook. In this example, the food system. So my suggestion to you in all the systems that you're working in, whether it's the education system, your family system, the healthcare system, tech, whatever you're working on, whatever systems you're trying to impact, to let them off the hook, to forgive whatever you have to forgive. So the question to you is who do you need to forgive and who needs to forgive you so you can be in your heart all the way. I assert that you can't imagine, you can't dream, it's going to be really hard to dream a new dream in whatever your new dream is and hold on to that dream in your heart with someone, something, yourself on the hook. Some of you need to forgive yourselves. So we have to let them off the hook. When we let them off the hook, we're free. We aren't disabled. We have full faculty, and we can go over in this simple example and chop a bunch of garlic and be in our heart, and I can hang on to the dream of when I walk out the door at Milani High School, it's working. It's all working. Food justice is here, right? There's some kids with not a lot of money eating really good food, right? That's food justice. That's what we all dream about. And it's possible to have fun doing this for me. So forgiveness can be like, oh my God, you know, a big deal. You got them on the hook. You know who you have on the hook. You know who you have on the hook, all of you. So let them off the hook. And dream a dream, hold it in your heart before you start the program, the process, the, the new thing. Walk in the door. You owe it to the constituents in the system to know what it looks like when you're done. You're doing a disservice to the people in the system that you're trying to impact if you have no idea what it's gonna look like when you're done. 
Thank you.